Wait, are you gaming on a Chromebook? Yep, it's got a high-res 120 hertz display, plus this killer RGB keyboard, and I can access thousands of games anytime, anywhere. Stop playing. What? Get out of here. Huh? Yeah, I want you to stop playing and get out of here so I can game on that Chromebook. Got it. Go ahead, break it down real Discover the ultimate cloud gaming machine, a new kind of Chromebook. Over the last several months, there's been a lot of differing opinions about generative AI. Whether you're for it or not, you have to admit that it's pretty mind-boggling technology. The popular online chatbot, ChatGPT, has the ability to interact back and forth using natural human language. Ask it to explain quantum physics like you're a third grader, or use it to debunk complex math problems. Essentially, it's a wealth of knowledge that can be used to help humans in countless ways, and it's only going to get bigger and better over time. And yes, there are valid concerns about this technology. One pressing problem is the possibility of it spreading inaccurate information. Since these programs can only use the swaths of Internet data that they were trained on, there's a risk of it spewing out biased answers or even making up information altogether while leaving users none the wiser. There is a sense of responsibility on us as users to do fact checking. I also think it's important for us to study the proper techniques of how to craft the right prompts or the right inputs to prevent and mitigate the possibility of tools like chat GPT presenting false information. And that's an area called prompt engineering. It's really looking into the science of how do we write prompts and how do we craft the inputs into these tools to get our desired output. That's Perpetual Bafur, the research director for the Learning Agency Lab an independent education-focused nonprofit. Bafur is an expert on machine learning, programming, and data science. She believes that generative AI has the power to make life a lot easier for humans. One is in creation, so creating an email, creating a document, or creating some specific deliverable. Two, I would think about it as a tool for analysis. So if I need to analyze a pre-existing document, I need to analyze a particular piece of information. I need its help in interpreting an idea or a concept. And then in three, the third category, I use it for brainstorming. So I'm not necessarily creating a specific deliverable or product, and I'm not necessarily using it to analyze a pre-existing document or product, but I just need it as a sounding board to bounce ideas off to put new ideas on the table. So those are sort of the three principles and tips I would give for those interested in using ChatGPT. In her role as research director at the Learning Agency Lab, she focuses more precisely on how AI and other technologies can help educators and students in the classroom. If the language model or the machine that's powering this generative AI tool like a chatbot has been trained on high quality educational data or high quality research on how students should learn or how teachers should teach, the generative AI tool can then be a positive tool in the classroom because it can help students in assisting them with maybe math homework or with classroom assignments and writing instruction and instructional practice as well. And so there are many different applications we're already seeing in the educational technology landscape of people leveraging generative AI to create new products, new tools in the classroom to assist students and teachers. While ChatGPT is a general purpose model, Bafur says that it's possible to retrain these models to specific contexts. Essentially, this means that it only pulls from that subsect of information, giving answers that are tuned for a specific desired output. To test this, Bafur and her colleagues took the latest version, ChatGPT4, and customized it so it can specifically provide evidence-based education advice. So what we did was we used the off-the-shelf version of ChatGPT as our base, but then we exposed it to an external custom 
knowledge base on research evidence of what actually works in education. And for that, we use the Doing What Works Clearinghouse as our source. At a high level, the Doing What Works Clearinghouse is a library of information of different studies on what actually improves educational outcomes. This modified chat GPT was more knowledgeable and accurate because it was exposed to up-to-date, research-backed education data. Baffour emphasizes, however, that a poorly phrased question can still throw off the model. This is where prompt engineering also comes into play. And so if there's a way in which we can craft our prompts to tell this new chatbot, okay, can you tell me about the best practices for increasing graduation rates in high school? And can you make sure the information you're producing is backed by this new custom knowledge base you're pulling from the Doing What Works Clearinghouse? If we're able to frame the prompts and guide the chatbot in a way so that it's able to pull out more factual information, it can do so. But if we just enter a simple prompt like, tell me about graduation rates, then it might pull from the general knowledge base, it might pull from the custom knowledge base, and then you're still vulnerable to the risk of the chatbot hallucinating and producing false information. When interacting with an AI chatbot, Bafur recommends crafting the prompt around a specific persona. She uses this scenario as an example. You're an elementary math teacher who needs some ideas on how to teach arithmetic. If I wanted to use ChatGPT to generate some of these ideas, I would give it a persona. So in my prompt, I would specifically state, you are an expert elementary school math teacher. Design a lesson plan on addition and subtraction for a third grade classroom. So when you give ChatGPT a persona specific to the task at hand, you're more likely to get higher quality outputs more details on the context, what you need this output for, as well as giving it certain descriptors in terms of tone, quality, genre. So let's say as a separate example, a really simple one, you wanted to craft an email. You can give it descriptors like be brief, be informal, be professional, be kind. There are many different ways in which you're creating a persona for these tools so that they're able to craft a response and use language to your liking and to your context. Bafur says that ChatGPT is great at reworking its response as you interact back and forth and get closer to what you're looking for. So, the next time you're hitting your head against a wall to write an email or memo or don't fully understand the topic at hand, try out ChatGPT you might be surprised what you end up with. To find out more about this topic and our guest, Perpetual Bafur, head to viewpointsradio.org. This segment was written and produced by Amira Zaveri. Our studio manager is Jason Dickey. I'm Gary Price. Coming up on Viewpoints. You can even filter down to the level of the kinds of bags that you like, so grocery bags or bread bags. And all of that is representative of the food that happens to be surplus in the marketplace that you live in. Discounted mystery bags of food? Sign me up. Then... It's everything from not being able to read a newspaper article to not being able to understand a job instruction manual or a credit card agreement or a lease agreement. Why we're failing students when it comes to reading in America. I'm Marty Peterson. And I'm Gary Price. These stories in depth on your public affairs magazine, Viewpoints. And that's Viewpoints for this week. Follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram to learn more about upcoming shows and find a library of past programs on Apple Podcasts, Google Play, and Spotify. Plus, you'll always find previous segments and more information about our guests at viewpointsradio.org. Join us again next week for another edition of Viewpoints. Whatever you're saving up for, a CD from Sandy Spring Bank lets you grow your savings at a guaranteed rate. Right now, earn interest at 5.50% APY on an eight-month CD special or 5.00% APY on a 14-month CD special. Learn more at sandyspringbank.com slash cdspecials. 
Minimum opening deposit to earn the annual percentage yield is $500 for the 8-month CD special and $2,500 for the 14-month CD special. Member FDIC.